Good evening. Welcome. Hello. Welcome to Midweek Goes to Relate. We are thrilled to be here with you guys tonight. Thanks for being willing to be up for a little bit of a change tonight. If I haven't met you, I'm Casey Sunstead, and it is my privilege to be part of the Relate ministry. Lately, my job has looked like getting to host the Relate podcast. If you haven't checked out the Relate podcast, we invite you to do so. There's a card on your table that tells you where you can find it. Basically, on the Relate podcast, we host a conversation that helps you to get curious about the way that you relate to yourself, to God, and to others. And so you can check it out on the Willow app or find it wherever you find your podcasts. So thanks for being up for a change of scenery tonight. This is super different. And so I wanted you to be able to know what to expect tonight. Here at Relate, midweek goes to Relate. Obviously, you're around tables. So what we're going to do tonight is you're going to hear from two different teachers, Deb Schertz and then Mike Shintani. And following each teacher, we'll have some time for you to reflect on the teaching and then discuss some questions that we're providing for each of your tables. We're going to have a fun time together. And they tell me that the midweek group loves to learn. So I'm confident that you guys are going to really enjoy what the Relate team has planned for you tonight. Now, as I transition to inviting up our first teacher, there's something that needs our attention. Being the midweek crowd, I'm pretty confident that you guys might know Rick shirts more than you know Deb shirts. And so, don't worry. I've come up with a quick thing that we can do to bring you up to speed. You guys are going to need, everybody should have one red card and one blue card. Each person, get those out, get those ready, because you're going to be voting with your cards. We're going to play a game called Which Shirts? Okay, so I'm going to tell you some facts, and this fact is either about Rick shirts or Deb shirts. If it's about Rick, I want you to vote by holding up your blue card, and if you think it's about Deb, then you hold up your pinkish, reddish card. Okay, are you guys ready? Which shirts? Which shirts do you think is a Taekwondo black belt? Okay, okay, oh, a lot more people think it's Deb. And the answer is Deb. Good job. Deb is super tough. You do not want to meet up with her in a dark alley. Okay, which, this is really hard to say, which shirts is much younger than the other? Which one's younger? It's like this side thinks it's Rick and this side thinks it's Deb. Who's younger? Tell us the answer. Rick. Rick is one year and one month younger than Deborah. It's super a lot, you guys. It is. Okay. Which shirts was a valedictorian and was voted most studious by their peers in high school? Okay, okay, okay. Let's see the answer. It was Deb. Which shirts got an extra ear piercing in college? Okay, okay, about, it looks like half from here. Let's see which one. It was Rick. You guys, this guy pierced his own ear with a Christmas ornament to be festive at a Christmas party. Ew, Rick, ew. Okay. And the last one. Which shirts played the upright bass in jazz band in high school? Okay, tell us the answer. It was Rick. How'd you guys do? Thank you for playing my game. I wanted to introduce you to my friend and teammate, Deb. Let's welcome up 
our valedictorian Taekwondo black belt. Oh, that is too funny. You guys are pretty good with those answers. Well done. Well, yes, my name is Deb, and I have had the privilege of working with Casey and team on Relate the last several years. And it's our desire to raise both curiosity and motivation around emotional, relational, and things spiritual health. So it's a great, um, a great thing that I get to be a part of. Super grateful. And we're just glad you're here with us tonight. Good job making your way to the activity center. We're gonna just dive right in. Our lives are stories, and they're stories filled with both beautiful and broken parts. And I think it's easy for us to imagine that God could use the beautiful parts of our stories to point others to him. But tonight we're actually gonna take a look at the broken parts of our stories because they are actually often the most helpful points of connection to connect with others who need Jesus. We're gonna start back at the very beginning when Jesus left the church with a mission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And interestingly, the church has had kind of a variety of different approaches to fulfilling this mission, right? We have gone through an era of kind of a hellfire and brimstone Sinners in the hands of an angry God, emphasis. And then we, at other times, have shifted more towards a victory campaign where God can deliver the life you've always wanted, right? And we can give you steps to get there. Well, tonight we're asking, could there be a different way, another way? What are the people that we are longing to reach out to? What are those who are far from Christ actually longing for? Could it be that they long for empathy from us before answers? Perhaps connection and common ground. And if so, what might that common ground be? All right, well, Jesus said in John 16, he said, in this world you will find Trouble, trouble, right? We know this to be true. We don't have to look very far. Rain falls on both the just and the unjust, on the seeker and on the saint, on the rich and on the poor, on the sick and on the well, on the curious and the convinced, right? Trouble is just a part of life this side of heaven. Trouble is some great common ground. Pain is actually normal. It's inevitable. There's no way around it. This side of heaven, we can't avoid it. I wonder where you tonight, just right here in the activity center, I wonder where you are feeling pain in your life. I've got some current pain in mine, and I bet you do too. We don't have to look far. It could be financial stress, Marriage pain, parenting challenges, health problems, the loss of a loved one. You might be feeling pain from harmful choices of other people, or perhaps pain from the impact of your own harmful choices in your life or in the lives of others. Guys, these are just universal struggles. We're all gonna have pain, and if we don't feel it in some of these areas today, we have the opportunity to feel it tomorrow. Yeah, it might be heading our way. We don't like pain and brokenness and struggle, but it becomes even more problematic when we have faulty theology about pain and struggle. I grew up believing that my life should really perfectly showcase how a life um, lived in relationship with Jesus um, just leads to harmony and reflects perfectly on God's character. Now, this is impossible. I exaggerate a little. But truly, I really felt like I was responsible um, to, to be the good and perfect person to point others to Jesus. 
And Jesus does offer us wisdom for living, and he offers us um, a more abundant life as we walk with him. But our theology breaks down when we feel that those who walk with him should not struggle, should not trip along the way, should not be broken, should not still be in need of healing. I remember hearing some sharp comments as a teenager um, from some adults in my world, and they had heard that a pastor in our area was struggling with depression. And this was unimaginable um, to the people with me. And um, the belief there was that there must be a significant problem in this pastor's spiritual life if he was having such a struggle. Well, this thinking was not helpful for me as I continued to grow and have struggles of my own. I kind of internalized a message that it's not okay to struggle and it's not okay to be broken. It's not okay. And this was breeding ground for me, for shame, for hiding. I wonder if you've had experiences like that. Have you ever felt performance pressure that you can't be broken, that you can't be hurting if you desire to reflect a good and perfect God? Well, this belief doesn't help us, does it? No. If we tend to deny and hide our struggles in pain, it creates a whole nother set of problems. We often showcase a happy and joyful Facebook image of our lives, and we kind of push brokenness and pain out of sight. Thankfully, Jesus teaches us something very different. Um, Jesus did not criticize or condemn the sick or those who struggled, he actually preferred these people as his friends. His disciples were a broken bunch, and he regularly spent time with social outcasts, tax collectors, cheaters, adulterers, and the rejects of society. His harsh words seemed to only be reserved for those who believed they were completely well and had no need of him. So I want to read to you a passage in Luke chapter 5. Levi gave a large dinner at his home for Jesus, and everyone was there, taxmen and other disreputable characters as guests at the dinner. The Pharisees and their religious scholars came to his disciples greatly offended. What is he doing eating and drinking with crooks and sinners? Jesus heard about this and spoke up. Who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? I am here inviting outsiders, not insiders, giving an invitation to a changed life, changed both inside and out. I love that. Jesus actually wants to change any false theology we have on brokenness and sickness and pain. Pain is normal, and pain is also an opportunity for healing. For healing, Jesus came to help the sick. Who is sick? Well, I am. And who is broken? I'm broken. We're all broken. And friends, this side of heaven, we're going to continue to need Jesus to continue his healing. It will continue, continue till the day we meet Jesus face to face. Well, ironically, as my story continued, um, following pregnancy, I had a struggle with postpartum depression. And it actually took me a year to recognize that because depression and following Jesus had been taught as so mutually exclusive um, in my young years. Depression was bigger than I could beat on my own. I'm a fighter, you know I'm a Taekwondo black belt, so I'm a fighter, but this was something that was so dark and heavy, I could not fight my way out of it. And do you know what I discovered? One of the best things, friends, I discovered that Jesus wanted to meet me right 
where I was. I also discovered that I could be as surrendered to him as I was capable of being and still struggle. Yeah, Jesus did not want me to sink in shame and to hide. He actually desired to meet me right there in the midst of my struggle. And it didn't even matter whether the roots of my struggle were physical or whether they were emotional or whether they were spiritual. Jesus just loved me right where I was. And I reflected upon this too at that time, like this side of heaven, I'm not going to have my spiritual act at 100%, right? Like we are as surrendered as we know how to be and we want to walk with Jesus. But this side of heaven, we still need his healing. It kind of took the pressure off of me. I could just let Jesus meet me where I was. Well, a few years ago, I was invited to look back on the rest of on my life and consider, could there be other broken parts of my story that need Jesus' healing? And friends, I am so glad that I was given this opportunity. Initially, I resisted. Yes, I just did not see much of a point to look back for negative things. I mean, what's past is past. And my parents, I'll be the first to defend them, they did, they gave such, they gave me so much, so much beauty in my life from all of their sacrifice and efforts. So I resisted. But I had wise people in my life who encouraged me to go ahead and take a season anyway to look back and learn, not blame. Well, I chose to do some of this important work right here on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock in Recover. And you may not be aware that Recover is not just a place for those of us who might struggle with addictions. It is actually a place we've written our curriculum in-house, and it is a broad curriculum and a place to grow for every single one of us. Recover offered me both a curriculum to guide me through some of the story work, and it also offered me a community to grow and to heal. Here are some of the questions I considered. How was I wounded in my formative years? What early negative inputs have led to negative consequences in my life? Did I have a voice in my young world? Was there abuse? Were there critical voices? Did I feel that I needed to be perfect to be lovely? What topics were off limits? Lots of questions. Here's what I discovered when I looked back to learn. I discovered that I had replaced early critical voices in my life which with a much harsher, harsher ever-present critical voice, my own, my own. I had developed a, a really consistent pattern of harsh, negative self-talk. I also discovered fear because I had somewhere along the way come to believe that everyone else's well-being depended upon me. And the stakes were high so I better measure up. That created all kinds of pressure for me to perform because I believed that I needed to be perfect in order for God and others to love me. And lastly, I also discovered that there were some very deep losses in my life that I really had not even named and I certainly hadn't grieved. Well, Guys, this was surprising to me. I had no idea. If you were to ask, if you were to have asked me, Deb, how are things? Like, I would have said before this work, I'm great. There are no big things that I need to process. I didn't know what was there until I took time to go back and take a season and learn. So, I wonder about you. Have you taken time, a season, to maybe look back? Are you in touch with the broken parts of your story? Where have you struggled? Where have others hurt you? 
Where have you hurt others? Where do you currently feel pain? Jesus did say, in this world, we will find trouble. He also said, I have come that they might have abundant life. Well, when I put these two statements side by side, I wonder how could these two things possibly coexist? Trouble and abundant life. And here's part of the beauty of trouble is I have learned by experience that the abundant life is not the absence of trouble. It's the presence of God. It's Emmanuel, God with us. The promise of hope. I discovered that pain can be a very helpful pathway to the abundant life that I actually long for. Because pain slows me down. It stops me in my tracks. I wonder if you can relate. And I have a choice. It can point me to Jesus. Pain does force a choice. We don't always choose the best next step. What will we do with our pain and brokenness? And what have you done? Will we do unhealthy things? We certainly can. We can deny our pain. We can minimize it. We can have unhelpful coping mechanisms. We can play the victim. We can numb it. Or we can use our pain. We can leverage it as an opportunity to meet God and to invite his healing. So pain has been the place where I have met God as a healer. Pain is also, and this is a surprise, a little counterintuitive, but it is an opportunity and a place to share God's hope. So some of my own struggles have offered me many opportunities to empathize and, op- and offer hope to others. Um, last week, I had someone important in my life share with me that he was sinking, and it felt like just a black fog, and he was describing a struggle with depression. Guys, I was able to meet him right there. I was so much more helpful in my place of pain and brokenness than I would have been had I not had that struggle. I was able to say, hey, I get it. I know that deep, dark, oppressive cloud that feels like, it felt like to me that it was closing in on me. I couldn't get out. And he looked up at me, and I'll never forget, he looked up with a little bit of hope in his eyes and said, you get it. And guys, like that meant so much if my pain could like offer the teeniest bit of hope to someone who hadn't met Jesus yet. We stood on common ground. We stood on level ground at the foot of the cross. We both needed Jesus. I was a fellow struggler right there with him. Well, there are many other connection points in my life from pain. And I know you guys have, I mean, the variety, like we all have different points. We might have relational disappointments. I've had health issues, losses of loved ones, betrayals. There's so many things we walk through. The common ground is trouble. The hope we have is Jesus. God is amazing because he will not waste anything, and he will not waste our pain if we entrust it to him. Our pain and brokenness become the very things through which he shines most brightly. And this verse, uh, I love it. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God. It's not from us. So when the world, when our friends who don't know Christ yet look at our lives, they are not confused. No one is confused. No one says, oh, look at the beautiful jar right? When we're a broken vessel, no one is looking at the beautiful jar. No, they see Jesus, 
the one who is shining through us. He is the light, and our lives showcase him. We are real people with real struggles, and we let our big God shine through our brokenness and offer hope to others. So we're going to shift gears a little bit here. Um, We're going to give you a couple of minutes for self-reflection, and then we're just going to seamlessly move into some time of group discussion around tables. Before I turn it over to you, though, I want to just offer a few best practices um, for being a good table mate and having a good group discussion. First of all, we are on a limited time. We have about 18 minutes um, for you guys to share around your tables. And if you do the math, if there are nine of you at your table, that's like two minutes each. So we're scratching the surface is all. We hope that you take um, some of the, the thoughts that are, you know, and things that come to mind and continue discussion after you leave this place. But tonight, we just want to get started. We're just raising some curiosity, some motivation for you to continue this work. Um, Some tables have facilitators, and if your table has a facilitator, they're just going to take the lead as soon as we start table discussion time. Don't be offended if they might reel the group back in if we move off topic or, or if someone starts to talk maybe a little longer um, then, then is provided, they might just tap you on the shoulder or ask you to wrap up in the next couple of minutes, okay? Don't feel offended. This is just normal. Um, not a problem at all. We'll just keep going. All right. And then just because we value safety here and because we don't have much time, we're going to ask you just to be good listeners to each other. This isn't really the forum for... Um, offering advice or fixing, but we can care for each other well by just listening. All right, so wasting no more time to set up your personal reflection. If you just flip the page over from your outline, I want to quickly tell you about a night 20 years ago that Rick and I were on our way home from our first Lamaze class. I asked Rick if he was going to pack our bag like the coach asked him to, no, like our instructor suggested, and we decided not to pack our bag that night, but a few hours later, we were in a full-blown crisis. Paramedics arrived, I was curled up in a little ball in pain, and they had the nerve to ask me, would you rate your pain on a scale of 1 to 10? Have you guys been asked this question? Oh my gosh, it was so unhelpful. I'm like, it's a 55. All right, in that moment, I did not appreciate the question. But tonight, and under more normal circumstances, sometimes it's a helpful question just to ask. How am I doing right now? What's my pain level? Okay, so we're going to have an exercise. It's self-explanatory right there in your self-reflection. We're going to invite you to be curious about your pain level. And there's going to be a clock counting down on the screens, and you're just going to move seamlessly into table discussion. If no one steps forward as your table facilitator, we didn't quite have enough facilitators, and we just thought that some of you could just rise to the occasion. Okay, so if no one takes the lead, um, just go ahead and begin sharing around your tables with those guidelines. You'll do just fine. Hi, everybody. Let me begin by just telling a couple stories about myself. For eight years now, I've been a small group leader in Alpha. And I love doing this because it's 100% relational evangelism. Now, if you don't know what Alpha is all about, essentially it's for people who would not call themselves Christians. And they come to experience nine weeks, once a week for nine weeks, discussions that are focused on learning about faith and God. Now, the first couple of weeks, we discuss who Jesus is what prayer is all about, how to read the Bible, all the basic stuff. Then around week four, we begin talking about the concepts of evil and sin. Now, inevitably, over the years, every time someone in my small group turns to me, the group leader, they also happen to know I'm a pastor, and someone reluctantly asks me if I've ever sinned or experienced evil. (laughs) Now, this is where it gets fun for me. I absolutely 
enjoy telling my groups how I used to escape in pornography and how it ate away at my heart, how it inflicted massive shame and guilt and skewed my understanding of sex. I tell my groups about how my parents got divorced and the ensuing custody battle brought on rage and anger at a level in me where I caused some physical destruction at my house. I, told, I tell them about how the residual emotional effects are things that I still have to address today in counseling. Now, I used that word enjoy just a moment ago to describe all this. Now, no, there is no enjoyment at all in any of the pain that came or still comes today from these parts of my life. The part I do enjoy is the bonding that happens between these group members and I. Almost immediately, there's this sense of, he's one of us. My small group members realize that I'm just as messed up as they are. I'm a Christian. I'm a pastor. I've likely got more pain in my life often than they do. I am finally trusted. The doors in the group open. Story number two. Two years ago, when we found out that my wife was pregnant, we decided to tell everyone in our family and our close friends. They literally found out the same time we did. Now, we knew the risk of sharing our exciting news really early. Seven weeks later into our pregnancy, I was in Beijing of all places when Trin, my wife, told me that there were signs of a miscarriage starting. I quickly got back uh, to Chicago to find Trin curl up on our bedroom floor, screaming in physical pain. It turned out that, in fact, we were miscarrying. Now, all of that transpired within about two weeks. But then, as many, of, as many of you might be able to relate as well, the emotional darkness that we found ourselves in lasted for months and, in a way, still subtly touches us today. Now, while that baby never walked a day on this earth, it had a huge impact on moving people closer to Christ in a span of just seven weeks. Our family and friends, many of which who don't have a relationship with Christ, experience how excited we were and then how depressed we were. They ask questions on how we reconcile God's goodness with tragedy. They were open and interested to talk about, does God really have a plan? Our pain laid a path to some of the richest evangelistic conversations I've ever had. My last story, and this is a current one. Over the past 18 or so months, there are times that it's been extremely painful for me to be part of this church. There's been a tremendous amount of distress and sadness. My wife commented recently to me that she had only seen me cry four times. At our wedding was number one, and then at funerals three times afterwards. When our leaders and our elders all left within a span of a couple weeks, about 18 months ago, I cried for the fifth time, and I have more since then about our church. Here's what I've found to be true about my friendships. When I've acknowledged head-on how messy our situation is, been honest on how distraught I have felt, and pointed out the hope that I have for the future, people in my life who have, would have never wanted to engage in a conversation about church with me now suddenly can sit at my table and talk an hour or so about it. Could it be that the best time in any recent time to invite people on a journey of faith here at our church, could that be actually right now? Earlier, Deb invited us to be curious about our pain, to lean in, and now I'm going to share some practical ways on how you can use your pain as a pathway in meaningful ways to point people towards Christ. So the first idea is this. You have to seize the moment. God will orchestrate perfect moments for you to engage in past or present pain in a conversation. And it's going to be up to you to seize the moment when someone is opening a door for you. Will you engage? It might be with your boss at one of your monthly reviews. It might be after this Thanksgiving dinner and it's only you and your cousin still sitting at the table chatting. It could be while sitting, sitting around a fire pit in your backyard with a couple neighbors, with your son or daughter on a long car road trip, over a weekly coffee with a lifelong friend, or it could be with a stranger that you're sitting next to on an airplane. You know when the moment is there, 
when it happens. You can feel it. Your friend just let you, let you into a tidbit of their pain. And a voice comes into your head and your heart. It says to you, if that person only knew that I had this similar struggle or I have the same pain. There's something deep inside of you that wells up. You might feel a little anxious. You might feel like this is going to be risky. And you feel empathy because you're connecting. Pay attention to that. Pay attention to that feeling. Pay attention to that voice in your head. It very might well be that the Holy Spirit is nudging you to connect through your pain. Now, the person on the other end may be experiencing something completely different to any sort of pain that you've ever experienced. Yet, there's still an opportunity there. Simply sharing that you've experienced pain and how it looked and how it felt validates that you understand where the other person is at. When your life is normalized with the other person, the amount of influence, the amount of trust, the amount of access you get to the other person's heart goes up and up. We think that we'll impress people with our strengths, but we connect with people through our vulnerabilities. Now, there's also the case where a friend of yours or a family member hasn't really ever given you much to go on. The way they talk about their lives is that it's all great, it's all perfect. These folks might never admit to having any sort of pain. Seizing the moment in these sort of friendships and relationships is what I call offering up. Again, I believe God provides the right moment in these sort of friendships where you will get a signal to simply share a pain point in your life that wasn't specifically solicited. For example, you and your lifelong friend Gabby get coffee once a week. Gabby has been on your heart to point towards God for years, and you've been trying. You've invited her to church many times, but she just doesn't come. You've tried bringing up the topic of God and faith gently over your coffees, but it's clear there's just not much interest there. So just as Gabby does every single week when you get together, she asks you, Hi, how are you doing? But this time you've been prompted. You want to seize the moment and offer up. So instead of answering the standard way, oh, I'm good, everything's been great, you go for it. And that might look like you saying, Bob and I have had a pretty rough month and, we month and we just started marriage counseling. Or you might say, the days are getting shorter and my seasonal depression is really getting tough right now. The entire goal here is to offer up vulnerability and spark deeper levels of relationship and genuine friendship. Which, if this works, this dramatically improves your ability to point someone to Christ. In the case of your friend Gabby, as you tell her about your pain and she possibly responds by sharing in any pain that she's experiencing in her life, over time, you're going to get the opportunity to share how Christ is woven into the fabric of pain. And you know what that is when you're doing that? That's evangelism. Pointing people to Christ through real life experiences. It's this type of relational evangelism that I believe has 10x the power of inviting someone to a random church service. Seeing is believing. Them seeing you in your life leads to believing. Second is choosing the right story. Now, we all have a repertoire of many pain experiences, and you need to use these wisely. If your friend is opening the door to you about their marital breakdown, for example, and you're sensing this would be a great time to share pain from your past in relationships in order to connect, don't bring up the story of how you got into a tiff with your hairdresser over the haircut you got. Your story doesn't have to be the same scenario as theirs, but it should be close in the intensity or the weight. Try to meet your friend where they're at with a similar level of experience pain. Next, do the dance of both listening and telling. Listening and telling over time. When connecting with someone through your pain experience, the idea is not to vomit your entire story in one single marathon session. Doing the dance of listening and talking involves hearing part of their story, then sharing part of yours. And then they share part of theirs a little bit further, and then you go further. It's mutual sharing. 
in my alpha group, my small group gets to hear about how God has used pain in my life over the course of all nine weeks. As trust grows in our group and the masks start to come down, each week I get to hear a little bit more about pain in their life and I get to share more about mine. We told our friends and family about our miscarriage kind of quickly, most of them via text. However, we had weeks of dinners following that, weeks of coffee connects where we got to share how we were doing and talk about the pain we were experiencing. Last, you will need to set the bar. Know that how much you share and to what extent and what details will be likely matched by the person you are leading in this journey of faith. If you are super vague, something like, yeah, when I found out I had cancer, it was really difficult, and that's as far as you go, the person you're trying to lead is going to go just that far as well. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, this type of engagement is not a therapy session. Oversharing or sharing too many details is likely to actually be counterproductive. You don't want to laden your other, the other person with something that they can't handle emotionally. You also don't want the other person to get all caught up in your details and really lose the essence of the conversation, which is the pain. What's most important, what's most important is sharing how you felt, what the pain felt like, rather than the details of what happened. Share just enough of what happened so the other person has a clear window into your pain. Now, as you apply these practical ways of sharing pain, here are five do's and five don'ts. We'll start with the do's. Trust the Holy Spirit. In the moments you're being prompted to share and engage, go for it. Trust the Holy Spirit. He works on us by that gut feeling often. Two, stay connected, stay current, and follow up. Be as present in you, as you can in the other person's life and go the journey. Often, these type of relationships are over time, not just one time only. Number three, realize your own pain is being redeemed. Romans 8.28 says that God works for the good in all things, good things and bad things, for those who love him. Realize that your pain has the power to be used in good ways. Four, ask if you can pray for that person. This may be the only time the other person senses anything spiritual in the conversation. It could be right at the end when you ask to pray for them every time you guys connect. Number five, realize that sharing and listening is pure evangelism. Yes, stopping people on the street corner to talk to them about Jesus is one form of evangelism. But just as much or even more is being present in, present in someone's pain. Here are the five don'ts. One, don't over-spiritualize your story. Stray away from making your story sound like a sermon that your friend won't relate to. Two, don't tell the person they're a sinner. If they're explaining some current behavior or action that they're involved in that's causing them a lot of pain, don't judge them. If you do, they're going to walk away. Three, don't tell the person they need Jesus. This can disintegrate any trust that you've been building. Allow this person to experience Jesus through your actions and your love versus telling, you, telling them that they need him. Four, give advice only if asked. And if not asked, don't give advice. Just listen. And five, don't fix people. The goal of this is not to tie a bow, a fancy pretty bow on the situation and call it done. The goal is not to resolve their pain, it's to empathize alongside them. Now, to wrap this up, the posture in doing this type of sharing needs to be one of, I understand you. The posture needs to be, I can't make things better for you, but I'm right here with you in this painful place. The posture is, you're not alone. I'll be alongside you. The posture is empathy. Share a visit, vision you might see for their future to comfort them. Inspire them by pouring words of hope into their lives. Invite them into something more. More relationship with you, more relationship with others. Encourage them. And can I encourage you? This is hard. This is still hard for me. 
it's hard for me to share just a couple of things I did with one person, namely like a couple hundred in this room here today. But it does get easier over time, and it's worth it. It gets easier because you'll begin to experience something beautiful. You'll be able to experience your pain being the key that unlocks someone's faith journey. And when you see that happen, you'll be glad you took the risk to do it. God weaves these precious moments of pain sharing for you to be another vehicle for the Holy Spirit to be present in someone else's life. I'm going to turn this back over to you and your table. There's four hypothetical situations on the worksheet that you have. Here's the uh, assignment. If one of those four situations happened to you, the question to discuss is, how would you handle it? How would you seize the moment? Would you even engage? And if so, which story, which pain story from your life could possibly connect with this person you're talking to? Could I encourage you to share parts of that pain story just right now, even around your groups? Practice that. Casey will come up at the end to close our time together. Hope you have a great group discussion. Thanks. Well, thank you for coming tonight and engaging in this different midweek, this midweek field trip, if you will. And we just want to say thank you for engaging, and we invite you this week to go forth and be jars of clay that hold the light and share it with other people through your interactions using your beautiful parts of your story and the broken parts of your story to bring hope and faith and love to others. So go in peace.